what happens when you die? Thinking about what happens uh, after death um, and what happens during death and as a consequence of death has been a human preoccupation uh, for the duration of the human race, really. It's always been the great unknown. And there's been, of course, a wide variety of theories put forward as to what might happen uh, once we die. You may uh, be familiar with uh, this chap. His name is uh, Friedrich Nietzsche. Um, and if you're not familiar with him, you might be familiar with some of his uh, quotations. Um, for example, that which does not kill us makes us stronger. You'll be aware of that um, statement. That's uh, straight from Nietzsche. Uh, God is dead is another one, so he was very much a humanist. So his uh, uh, philosophies, his life was, you know, from the 1850s through to 1900. He died in the year 1900. Um, and he's a humanist philosopher, was, you know, pretty much as humanist as you can get. Um, so as a humanist, he realised that death was inevitable, as everyone pretty much realises, I guess. Um, but his issue, of course, was that we can't do anything to control this. Um, he certainly didn't believe in an afterlife. He didn't believe in a God. Um, in fact, he said that God was dead, not in the sense that he didn't exist necessarily, but that we'd sort of philosophised God out of our lives. Science had explained him away, uh, and we didn't need God anymore. That's what he meant by that term. But he did realise that death was inevitable, that life was brief, um, and death was the end of any consciousness, um, and it was permanent and eternal. He certainly didn't believe in any form of the afterlife. So his solution to this was, as we've got on the screen there, to die proudly when it is no longer possibly possible to live proudly. So we're talking about a you know, proud humanist here. Death of one's own free choice, death at the proper time, with a clear head and with joyfulness consummated in the midst of children and witnesses, presumably adult children, uh, so that an actual leave taking is possible while he who is leaving is still there. So his idea was, you know, as the final frontier, he needed to control the way that he died um, and that suicide basically was the, the uh, option there because, you know, control, the lack of control over his life was something that he didn't want to be able to contemplate. So control of the timing, the method of your departure was uh, Nietzsche's solution to this issue. Um, so that's a fairly typical humanist point of view. They might not reach that sort of extreme conclusion, but with the, the fact that um, death is inevitable, that it's the end, that there's nothing after death, um, does uh, consume the, the mind somewhat. Now, unfortunately for young uh, Friedrich, his death was pretty much the opposite. He uh, contracted syphilis, which caused a mental degeneration in his mind and uh, lots of psychosis for the last few years of his life. Uh, literally proving wrong that statement that that which doesn't kill us makes us stronger. Um, he suffered a couple of strokes that left him paralysed and un unable to speak until he died about two years after his first stroke in about 1900. So unfortunately for Friedrich, he wasn't able to carry out this idea of dying proudly and under his own control and all that sort of thing. But he did uh, recognise that death was the end and if you don't have a belief in God, uh, then that's the logical conclusion you really have to come to. So that's one, I guess, extreme of what is uh, the human view of death. By way of contrast with Nietzsche, we've got um, Dr. Duncan McDougall. Uh, and in 1901, so only a year after uh, poor old Friedrich passed away, uh, he took it upon himself to weigh six people in a nursing home uh, just before and after death and worked out that the human soul actually weighs 21 grams. Um, so um, he picked people whose death was imminent, you'll be pleased to know, um, and who were dying of something that would ensure that they lay still while they died uh, and weighed the people while they were in their beds uh, using a huge industrial scale, so not a you know, particularly peaceful way for them to pass away, but in the interests of science, they all laid still. Um, and he um, proved, in, uh, to his own satisfaction at least, that the human soul weighs 21 grams. Um, yes. So uh, he, he then went on to prove, he wanted to prove that animals have no soul. Um, so he did the same experiment with 15 dogs. Of course, that's slightly harder to wait until uh, a dog is lying still and imminently about to die. So he probably poisoned the dogs. But apparently the dog's weight didn't change before and after death. So 
um, that really proved his thesis that the human soul weighed 21 grams and that animals have, have no soul. Uh, and his results were published in the New York Times. We've got a cutting from the New York Times there. Um, the truth is about his, um, his uh, scientific experience was that actually only one of his patients lost the required three-fourths of an ounce, that amounts to 21 grams, that his conclusion was based on a couple of them actually put on weight after death, curiously. Um, and the dogs, dogs don't have sweat glands apparently, which stops them from losing any um, liquids or anything, and so they, their weight doesn't change at all. But that was the uh, useful scientific work uh, of uh, Dr. Duncan McDougall. So we've got these contrasting ideas that humans have come to the conclusion about, that either, you know, death is the end, uh, there's nothing more, and if you don't have a belief in God, then that's probably going to be your logical conclusion. But most other, um, most people that are religious, that believe in um, some sort of God, uh, have the idea that we've got some sort of immortal spark within us, uh, generally referred to as the soul, and that, that, that's a separate thing from the body, and that lives on even when our bodies have uh, given up. So, almost every religion relies on this, uh, this concept of the separation between a body and a soul um, for their belief in some sort of afterlife. It doesn't matter if you believe um, in heaven and hell, for example, as most of Christianity does, uh, and as Judaism does, and as Islam does, and as most of paganism did and does. It doesn't matter if you believe in heaven and hell or in reincarnation, um, as most of the, a lot of the, in, uh, the Eastern religions, Hinduism and, and Buddhism do. Almost universally, religious people believe that uh, the body and the soul are separate entities. Uh, they believe that the body can die, but the soul is immortal. Um, and there's a slight amount of human pride in that too, isn't there? That there's something in me that um, you know can't die. I can't you know waste what I've you know all these years of wisdom I've built up over the years. Um, so people can't quite grasp the fact that that perhaps death is the end. They believe that the soul leaves the body uh, immediately at death um, for some other destination. It might be heaven or hell, depending on how good or bad you've been, or it might be another body if you're if you believe in some. Um, Eastern religion like Hinduism. So that's the general concepts. We've got uh, Nietzsche on one hand who believes that death is the end, uh, and on the other hand we've got most of the world's religion that believe in some sort of uh, soul that leaves the body on death, um, and we carry on while our, our body um, gives up. But what we want to look at tonight, of course, is what the Bible actually says about what happens uh, at death. A couple of quotes for, um, for this. In, and in many ways, Nietzsche, um, the atheist, was actually more correct in his assessment of death than the, uh, many of the religions of the world. Uh, Nietzsche saw death as the end. Um, life was the time of opportunity and celebration and the time for all that sort of thing. Um, death was inevitable, but it was permanent. Um, and it was a permanent end to any sort of life at all. So in many ways, his theories about death were much closer to reality and what the Bible teaches than many religions. So most religions see sort of the death as the gateway to a new, hopefully improved life, not if you go to hell of course, that's, that's worse. Um, yeah, so it's, death is sort of life, your version 2.0 according to most religions, but that's not what the Bible says. Um, death is the cessation of life in any sense. We've got a couple of quotes from the Old Testament there on the screen. Psalm 6 verse 5 tells us, For in death there is no remembrance of thee, the thee there being God himself. In the grave who shall give thee thanks? Now, you know, if we go to heaven on death, you'd think there'd be some remembrance of God up there because that's where God lives. Um, and yet here it says there's no remembrance of thee in death. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might, for there is no work, that sounds good, no device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom, not quite so good, in the grave whither thou goest. So again, no um, inclination or no indication here of any sort of life uh, existence after, after death. Now you might say, well, that's sort of talking about in the grave, so that's talking about our bodies, perhaps the souls go on to uh, bigger and better things. 
Uh, but you, know, the, you can clearly see here that these two verses really uh, indicate that uh, we do nothing, we create nothing, we know nothing. All the accumulated knowledge that we might have now uh, amounts to nothing once we've died. Not exactly life version 2.0, is it? So um, you'd think also that um, the psalmist, if he was going to mention heaven, would have done so at this point, that, uh, you know, in, for in death there is no remembrance of thee, in the grave who shall give thee thanks? He might have thought the psalmist would have had some sort of disclaimer about people who do go to heaven, that they still do give God thanks, but there's nothing in that psalm about that. And it's not just limited to people in the grave here, because here in Ecclesiastes 9, verse 5 and 6, again, the same idea as we read about. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward. So if you're looking for reward at the point of death, Ecclesiastes said, no, that's not the place to look for it. They know not anything. There's no more reward at that point. If you think that you're going to heaven or onto a, another better life, uh, then that's not the case according to Ecclesiastes. For the memory of them is forgotten, also their love, their hatred, uh, their envy is now perished, neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. So, whereas the previous quotes were talking about people in the grave particularly, um, where the body is, someone might argue, uh, this is about the dead generally, not limited to just the grave now. And we can see here that they know nothing at all. All emotions are ceased. Um, there's no reward there, so, so death isn't some gateway to a better life. Um, it's not the source of a reward. In fact, as we're going to see in a minute, death is, uh, in the Bible, is a punishment. It's not a reward at all. Um, so death is the punishment, not a gateway to a worse punishment, uh, as those who believe that you go to hell might uh, think and not the, uh, not the gateway to heaven either. So death is the punishment. How do we know that that is the case? We'll come back to Genesis uh, chapter 1, and we'll see that God established this pretty early on, well, really very early on, um, at the point of creation. So we want to show that death is not a gateway to further life, it's not the gateway to reward, but it is in fact... Uh, a punishment for, from God, um, and it is the cessation of life. Genesis chapter 1 uh, and verse 31. We're just going to pick out a couple of verses out of this section, this early section in Genesis, uh, to uh, show uh, the points that we want to show. Genesis 1 verse 31. God saw everything that he had made, and so, okay, Genesis chapter 1 has gone through and, and shown the establishment of the earth, and everything on it, all living things, uh, the water and the land, um, all the heavens, uh, and God saw everything that he had made, including humanity um, and, and the trees to give them life. And behold, it was very good, and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. And then chapter 2 and verse 1, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. So everything was created very good originally, um, including... Adam and Eve, who were the first male and female that God created. And then in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 16, uh, God uh, talks to Adam and he says in verse 16, God commanded the man, Adam, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For, and this is the important thing, so he's given him an instruction, hasn't he? He's said, you know, you can eat of all the trees except for this one, because... In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So here's Adam and Eve, very good, as God created them. God says to them, or says to the man at this stage, uh, eat of all the trees, don't eat of that tree that uh, I've labelled the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because, and the punishment for doing that, for breaking my law, is going to be death. Now, well, you may well know the story that uh, Adam and Eve do eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the result of that, we read in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 17. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 17, But unto Adam he said, God says, so this is after Adam and Eve have eaten of the fruit that they were told they shouldn't, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, Eve, and hast, and hast eaten of the tree which, of, which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, 
Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles it shall bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So here God is saying, look, I told you what, exactly what would happen if you ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In the day that thou eatest thereof, you're going to become a mortal uh, creature. No longer very good, but uh, now instead mortal. You ate of the tree of the garden, uh, the knowledge of good and evil in the garden. Now, let me describe exactly what's going to happen to you. You're going to sweat, you know, work hard to, to eat uh, until you return back to the ground. For out of it thou wast taken, for dust thou art, I made you from the dust, and unto dust you're going to return. So it describes death for Adam there. And it doesn't sound like a gateway to a happier or even a sadder existence, does it? Death, death here, as described by God, is really the end. You were you created from dust and you're going to return back to dust again. Death is going to be the end. And death is, in fact, a punishment. Um, and it's hardly to be a punishment if it consisted of Adam going you know, to immediately to eternal bliss. So, but death is the punishment. God is not so vindictive that having you know, punished people by death for not believing in him or disobeying his commandments, he then continues to punish them into all eternity. Um, you'd think that God would have actually mentioned that to Adam. Not only are you going to die, you're going to, you know, your body's going to corrupt back to dust, but also you're going to go down to this nasty hot place and be tormented forever. You'd think that God might have mentioned that to Adam uh, as part of uh, his his agreement about the tree and eating of it. But he doesn't mention anything about that, does he? He just talks about the fact that if you sin, if you break my law, then you are going to die, and that is going to be your punishment. So, death is the punishment for sin, and it's a fairly direct connection between the two there. And as a result of this, uh, this punishment from God, as a result of them sinning, Adam and Eve's children also inherited a mortality, so they also die, and as their descendants, we also die, and also a tendency towards sin. So instead of being very good, um, now we have a tendency to doing the wrong thing rather than perhaps doing the right thing or no uh, bias at all. So uh, as their descendants, we inherit two things, mortality, we're going to die, uh, and also a tendency towards sin as well. So why do we die? It's summarised really for us in this quote from Romans chapter 5, verse 12, which you may not be able to read from the back there, but uh, it says there, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, uh, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So Paul, writing this letter in the New Testament in Romans, says, By one man sin entered the world, that is Adam, uh, and death by sin, so death came as a result of sin, exactly what God said would happen back in Genesis chapter 1, so it happened in Genesis chapter 3, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So we are uh, now, as the descendants of Adam, uh, all sinners, that's our tendency, we all break God's law, and we're also all mortal. So people are sinners, naturally, now, uh, and people are also mortal. So that's what we've inherited as a result of what happened in the, in the Garden of Eden. We inherit mortality from Adam and Eve, uh, and we all sin, and so we all die because of those two things. So that's the reason that we die. It's, it's a punishment for, uh, for sin, uh, and that's the way God has always painted it in the Bible. Let's talk about this idea of immortal soul, this uh, you know, 21 gram thing that's in our body somewhere. Um, the concept of our consciousness living on after death, you know, again, I say that you know, really this is a human vanity, isn't it? That we can't conceive that eternity is going, going to go on uh, without us, that all this you know, knowledge and, and uh, perhaps uh, you know, other things that we've built up in our lives uh, will continue on or you know, die with us, and that eternity, that time will continue on uh, without our uh, influence on it. Well, nowhere in the Bible do you find the idea that uh, consciousness has any existence except from uh, within the body. So the idea of immortal soul is not mentioned in the Bible, or in most, you know, the, the best translations of the Bible, we don't have this idea of an immortal soul. Uh, 
And in fact, the term soul, when it's translated as such uh, in the Bible, really just means that a conscious living body. It's nothing more complex to it than that. It's not describing something separate from uh, the body um, and certainly uh, nothing ghostly or spiritual about it. And in fact, um, souls die. So Ezekiel 18 verse 4, Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. There's no uh, idea there that um, your body's going to die, but your soul's going to live on if you sin. Um, it's uh, that uh, word soul there is used. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And again, you'll notice the connection here between sinning and dying. So death and sin are inexorably connected. Uh, so death is a punishment for sin and a result of uh, the mortality that we inherit because of Adam's sin in the first place. So the idea of an immortal soul is not found anywhere in the Bible, um, and you might be surprised to find that that term is not in, in the, the best translations of the Bible at all. Um, and in fact, the soul is really just a, a word that describes um, the consciousness within, within the body. It's nothing separate from the body uh, at all. So for soul, we could really read a person uh, or, or character or something like that. It's definitely not talking about some immortal spark that we might have that uh, the 15 unfortunate dogs did not have. So immortal soul is not something that's found in the Bible. And without that idea of an immortal soul, this sort of immortal spark within us, then most of the other theories about what happened to us after we die also sort of uh, collapse by the wayside. If there's no immortal soul, there can be uh, no hell. And this idea of a hell, that there's some sort of uh, place of punishment, um, generally thought to be fiery, but if you read you know, Dante's uh, Divine Comedy, the ninth circle of hell is actually icy, so you, know, you can come to whatever conclusion you like. But this idea of a, a really hot place, a really quite uncomfortable place that you might go to if you haven't been that good in this life, is uh, considered to be uh, the truth um, by most Christian churches. And it's been you know, perpetuated in films and computer games uh, even today. But as we said, if there's no immortal soul, then really there's no place for some, something like hell um, in uh, God's plan either. And the concept of hell really springs from uh, the Egyptian superstitions about the afterlife. Um, and uh, that's where uh, Christians got their concept of it from. So that went from the Egyptians to the Greeks and the, uh, the, um, the Christians adopted that around the third century AD. But we can't get away from the fact that hell is actually mentioned several times in the Bible. So in the Old Testament, um, so that's written in, in the Hebrew language and the New Testament is written in, in the Greek language. In the Hebrew, in the Old Testament, the, the, the Hebrew word is the word Sheol. And really that just means the covered place. Um, so we can get all these ideas about it being you know, something hot and fiery or something cold and freezing, as, as Dante thought it might be. But at the end of the day, the Hebrew word just means the covered place. And really, it's just talking about the grave. So where we all go, or you know, most of us will go when we die, uh, it's just talking about the grave. So the, the Hebrew word Sheol just means that. In the Greek, we have the word, uh, in the New Testament, we have a couple of words. Uh, Gehenna is one of them. You might have heard that term. And that's actually, while it's in the New Testament, it's actually a Hebrew word. Um, and it's derived from the Valley of Hinnom, which was a fiery place. But it was a fiery place because that's where um, Jerusalem used to chuck all their rubbish outside the city wall uh, and burn it, including the corpses of the poor and the criminals who couldn't afford a tomb to be buried in. So the idea of Gehenna being a fiery place is, is fair enough because it was basically the, the city rubbish tip in Jerusalem. Uh, including uh, the, uh, the paupers that were flung on there as well. So, uh, interestingly, going back to Dante again, um, hell was supposed to be right under Jerusalem. So if you want to find the gateway to hell, apparently Jerusalem is the place to start digging. In the New Testament as well, we have the word Hades as well. And again, this really just means the unseen place. So in Hebrew, we had the word Sheol, which means the covered place. Uh, and in a very similar way, the Greek word Hades means the unseen place. 
And again, in the New Testament, uh, if you look up where it's used, it really just refers to the grave. So obviously not something which you can see. It's covered. It's unseen. It is the, gra it is the grave. Uh, and that's how it's used in the New Testament. Of course, the Greeks had their own slant on this idea of Hades, which it did involve some sort of uh, fiery afterlife. But that's not a concept you'll find uh, in the Bible when it talks about the unseen place, the grave. So um, no hell, no heaven either. So again, the idea of no immortal soul really makes the, uh, the theory of going to heaven at, at death obsolete as well. Because if there's no immortal spark to go up there, then uh, we're going to have trouble getting there after our death. Now, what do we know about heaven? Well, we know in Isaiah 66 and verse 1 that it is uh, God's dwelling place. And he describes in, in a sort of image that heaven is God's dwelling place and the earth is God's footstool. So heaven is where God dwells. Um, now, we know that Christ ascended up into heaven uh, at his death. Turn with me to Acts chapter 1 and verse 11, and we'll have a quick look at this quote. <coughs> But you'll notice here that it's not Christ's soul going up to heaven, it's Christ literally, bodily, himself going up into heaven. Um, Acts chapter 1 and verse 11 says um, that um, they are just outside Jerusalem, back in verse 8. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, You shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And when he, that is Christ, had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So it's not some invisible soul that's ascending up into heaven here. It's him, his body, going up into heaven. And while they, that is his disciples, looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. So there's two angels which explained things and said to them, in verse 11, Ye men of Galilee... Why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So you might think, well, you know, there's Christ. He died, um, he was resurrected, and then he went up into heaven. Isn't it logical, perhaps, that his followers also go up into heaven uh, at death? Well, the first thing we note is that Christ goes up there in his body. It's not some immortal soul that goes up there. But if you turn over a couple of pages and have a look at Acts chapter 3, we'll see that, in fact, the reward that Christ gives to his followers is not going to be in heaven, but very much on earth. So Acts chapter 3 and verse 20, and these are now the words of the Apostle Peter, so one of Christ's preeminent followers, the Apostles. He says here in a speech, he shall send... Jesus Christ, which was preached, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive, so yes, he has gone up into heaven, until the times of restitution of all things which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his prophets since the world began. So you'll notice back in Acts chapter 1 and verse 11, it talked about Christ coming back down to the earth again. Um, he's going to come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. Well, here Peter talks about it as well, the idea that Christ is going to come. He's gone up into heaven until the times of restitution of all things. So to reward his followers, Christ is not going to pull them up into heaven. He is actually going to come back down to the earth uh, to reward them. So the Bible's pretty clear. Christ is returning back to the earth to reward his followers, as we can see there from the words of Peter in Acts chapter 3. And in fact, there's no, the concept of ascending up into heaven or descending down into hell, there's nothing like that uh, in the Bible as far as God's followers are concerned. And in fact, the hope of the Bible uh, is not ascension up into heaven, but is resurrection from the dead, resurrection to life on the earth. And we could go through, you know, there's literally hundreds of New Testament quotes directly referring to this idea of resurrection. And that is really the great hope of the Bible. Um, and I've listed a few of them there uh, on the screen, but the Bible is really literally full of references to the resurrection as the hope that God offers to us. So while death is a punishment for sin, God does offer us a hope uh, 
uh, beyond the grave, but it's certainly not in the form of uh, an immortal soul uh, ascending up into heaven. Acts chapter 24 um, and verse 14 and 15 is one of the quotes on there. And, and there it says in the words of the Apostle Paul, But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets, and have hope toward God, so Paul did have a hope, which they themselves also allow that there shall be an ascension up into heaven when I die. Well, that's not what Paul says. He says that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and and the unjust. So that's Acts chapter 24, verse 14 and 15. So Paul's hope, um, as all of our hopes should be, was the resurrection from the dead, not an ascension up into heaven, uh, and certainly not an immortal soul inhabiting some other uh, bodily form. So lots of, res uh, lots of references to resurrection right through both the Old Testament uh, and the New Testament. And that is uh, the hope of the Bible, not a uh, not that death is the gateway to a new life, but that resurrection from death is the gateway to a new life. Acts chapter 10 and verse 38 to 40. It's only a few pages over, so Acts chapter 10 and verse 38. And again, the words of Peter here. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Uh, so the devil is a, a type of, of sin, um, a, a, a humanisation of sin. For God was with him, and we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of, Jews, of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. So Peter says... This man, Jesus of Nazareth, went about doing good things. He had the power of the Holy Spirit. He had power. He went around healing people and doing good. And as a result of this, despite the fact that the Jews killed him and hanged him on a tree, in the sense that they crucified him on a tree, what does Peter tell us happened to him? Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. So as a result of Christ not sinning, and in fact, uh, being the only human to do so, um, doing good, as, as uh, the Apostle Peter describes it here, as a result of that, God raised him up and he became the first person to be resurrected to immortality. So this is a really brief summary of uh, the entire point of Jesus' life by Peter. He was good, he did no sin, so God raised him from the dead. And uh, really that is uh, a summary of how we can also uh, be um, resurrected from the dead as well. So God raised him up because he did no sin. He, he broke this nexus between sin uh, and death and opened the way for us to also be resurrected to immortality. <coughs> Again, the words of Peter um, in 1 Peter chapter 2 uh, and verse 21 to 22, where he writes, For hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example. So Christ is leading the way in this, that we should follow in his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. So this is the reason that Christ was raised from the dead and given immortality. So remember that death was originally instituted as a punishment for sin way back in Genesis chapter 1, uh, 2 and 3. Well, here we have a man who was sinless. What happens in that example? Well, the grave can't hold him, uh, as uh, it says in Acts chapter 2. Again, the words of Peter. So the grave is intended for, as a punishment for sinners, and yet here we have a man who was sinless. So the grave couldn't hold him, so he was resurrected from the dead. And this really is the hope of the Bible, that through association with the Lord Jesus Christ, we too can be raised uh, from the dead. And that's what Peter says here. That's, that's our hope, that we can follow his example. Um, he suffered, uh, leaving us an example, but we can also follow his example in the fact that he did no sin and was raised from the dead. We can also be raised from the dead if we are counted sinless through God's forgiveness. Let's see what someone who has actually returned from the dead has to say about this subject. 
Well, here we have the words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And it really just reinforces what we've already seen from the words of Peter. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. So here's what God wants from us. If we want to follow Christ through this path of resurrection from death to immortality, then what does Christ say we need to do? We need to believe in him. So not necessarily everyone that's going to be raised is going to get raised to immortality, but if we want resurrection to life, uh, to immortality, then we need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Though we were dead, yet shall he live, Christ tells us in John chapter 11. And Paul puts it slightly differently in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. He says there that the wages of sin is death. Again, what we've already seen from um, Genesis chapter 1, 2 and 3, the wages of sin is death. Mankind sins, so we die. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And if we can follow his example, then we can follow uh, his path to resurrection and to immortality as well. So again, that connection between sin and, and death has been broken by the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, by his sinless life. And we also can be raised by identifying with Christ's life. And not only raised from the dead, resurrected, but also to uh, receive immortality. Turn back to the reading that we read in the first of Corinthians uh, chapter 15. And here we can see these same principles coming out here uh, in Corinthians. So in first Corinthians uh, 15, which is a, a big chapter that really is all about resurrection, um, we see some of those principles that we've already uh, looked at. Have a look at, um, for example, Verse 3 of 1 Corinthians 15. And here, so Paul wrote this letter to the uh, believers that were in Corinth, and he says here, I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. So Christ is the first to be raised to immortality, as he's the first person that has done uh, no sin. In verse 12 that we read this evening, we begin to see the importance of this uh, idea of resurrection, and particularly of Christ's resurrection. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Now, this is important because this is the hope of the Bible. If there's no resurrection of the dead, then Paul is uh, saying that there really is no hope at all. It's not that we have the option of being raised from the dead or perhaps our soul goes up to heaven. Because he goes on to say in verse 13, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ is not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. So everything's pointless, Paul says here. If Christ isn't risen from the dead, then everything is pointless. There's no other hope in the Bible except for all this hope of resurrection from the dead. Verse 13, if, uh, which we've already read. So if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ isn't risen and everything is uh, is vain. And verse 16 sort of re-emphasizes this. For if the dead rise not, then is Christ not raised? So if there's no general resurrection of the dead coming, Paul says, then Christ wasn't raised. And if Christ isn't raised, again, your faith is vain, yeah, yet in your sins. You haven't been saved out of sin, if that doesn't happen. Then they also which have fallen asleep in Christ are perished. That's the end for them, if there is no resurrection from the dead. There is no other hope offered in the Bible. But there is a hope offered, because Paul says in verse 20, Now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that sleep. So Christ is like the first fruits of a harvest. He's the first one to be raised from the dead to immortality, and those that are associated with him are the rest of the harvest. They're going to follow uh, at the resurrection of the dead. Again, uh, concepts we've seen already in verse 21 and 22. For since by man, that is Adam, came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. So one man brought death and another man brought life, that is Adam and Christ. As he says in verse 22, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So Adam and Eve's sin brought death, Christ brought life through his sinlessness. Now you'll notice there it says that everyone in Christ shall be made alive. So not everyone's going to get raised from the dead. Uh, only those who are responsible because of their knowledge of Christ. 
everyone dies because, of course, we are all in Adam. Uh, we're all descendants of Adam and Eve, but not all are in Christ. Verse 23, when does this happen? Every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, and afterward, so again, this idea of Christ being the first to be resurrected, he's the first fruits, and afterward, they that are Christ's, when? At his coming. So when is all this going to happen? When is this resurrection from the dead and the possibility of, of uh, uh, being given immortal life? Well, it's going to happen at Christ's return back to this, this earth, as we saw in Acts chapter 11 um, and Acts chapter 3 as well. So Christ is coming back to the earth and then the resurrection of the dead is going to take place um, and then judgment on those who are raised uh, and those who are still alive who are responsible to judgment and then the possibility of immortality to those who have responded to the gospel call. And as a result of that, Psalm 72 describes this amazing kingdom that God's going to set up uh, on the earth um, at that time, a kingdom that's going to fill the entire earth so that we're not living in immortality in the same you know, stresses and worries that we have today, but it's going to be a time of peace and of plenty and of worship of God. So that's the reward of those who believe in Christ. So that's the Bible's hope that it offers, not uh, a separation of body and soul and, and ascending up into heaven, but the possibility of being raised from the dead and being given immortality when Christ returns back to the earth. So what happens when you die? Well, not much, to be honest. Uh, not much happens until Christ returns back to the earth. And if we've grasped the hope of the Bible, then we will have the opportunity for life again through the, resur the resurrection from the dead and the hope of life everlasting.